Shalom and welcome to another time of Israel's Hope Bible Church Online. My name is Ron Grossman and we're doing studies continuing called Riding Out the Storm, Dealing with the Coronavirus uh, COVID-19 uh, Pandemic and it's questions that keep coming up and are sent to us regarding what time in uh, biblical prophecy are we in? Are we in the end because of this uh, pandemic? So I want to put to um, put to ease some of those questions and um, uh, quickly um, go through some portions here in the book of Revelation. Specifically, we're going to be looking at chapter 16 with some added comments from other portions in the, in the, the book of Revelation. Before we start, let's uh, pray and ask the Holy Spirit to guide and direct. Father God, we'd ask now that you would overrule anything that would try to block this uh, message from going forward. We'd ask, Lord God, now that um, you would give wisdom in the things that are said and done, that your Holy Spirit would guide and direct in everything said and done, that you would receive all the glory and honor from all of this. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Wild speculations continue to proliferate. I continue to get uh, emails, text messages from people asking me, what about this virus? Is this the workings of uh, an evil uh, group in um, the Far East who are intent on ruling and running the world? As one ministry friend of ours asserted in a very well put together um, summary about a month ago now, all conspiracy theories end up in the same place. They implicate Israel, the Jewish people, and they end up in anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism ends up being the key point. The Jewish people are responsible for this, and they're in cahoots with whoever it is that created this virus. In recent interactions with some other believers, I was recently told just a couple of days ago that by one person we know here in, on this continent, that he fervently believes that we are in the middle of the tribulation period right now and that we're so close to the events of Revelation chapter 16. But that doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't make any sense because of what Revelation 16 says, chapter 16, verse 12. Let's look at that for a moment. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, and the ways of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now the assertion here is that all these things with the um, virus are to bring China to a place of prominence in the world. And to do this, they have to have a way to move their armies. Now, the response to this is, I think, just too simplistic. And it also gives us a clear picture of what we call simply this bad Bible exegesis. It's bad exegesis, the understanding of the word, the literalness of the word. The sixth bowl of Revelation chapter 16 is simply one of a series of judgments and events that take place at this juncture of the time of the events of the book of Revelation. Now I consulted a number of commentators and also consulted with whom I, I call ministry elders to me with a number of years experience in teaching and study in the word and some who, uh, who even taught me. Dr. Warren Wearsby and Dr. John Welvard have comments on Revelation 16 verse 12. Dr. Wearsby said that the nations of the Orient, the nations of the East, are the nations of the Orient and they are a combination of all those nations of the Far East. Dr. Walford says this is basically the same thing and he cites from Alford's Greek New Testament that the language there is literal and to the point understanding that Far East means the Far East. Charles Ryrie simply says this, these are the nations of the Orient. So there is going to be a great coming of a great army of nations out of the, or uh, out of the Orient who are going to come against Israel. Now, these kinds of migrations are nothing new. If you go back into ancient uh, history of the world, you'll know that the Middle East and Europe depended on the spice trade that came out of the Orient. The spices of the Orient, which were used at that time for the preservation and the preserving of food. 
um, there were no great refrigeration systems at, at play, and so they uh, people had learned to use various spices to preserve food for longer periods of time. But this is different here. This is not a group of people coming to trade. This is a group of people who are coming in the midst of great judgment and tribulation that is being poured out on this world. To even think or suggest that we are here at this point now in the tribulation period ourselves because we're in the midst of this pandemic I think is preposterous and it's pointless and again it shows error in biblical exegesis. Now some of the conspiracy theory also again needs to be dealt with. To be able to say or continue to say that China perpetrated this virus, well maybe they did. And maybe this is part of what this is all about, and I will speak to that <clears throat> at the end of this message. But it's preposterous again in the sense of this is not what is happening right now. We aren't there at this point now, and the reason why, well, if you want to back up into the other chapters of the book of Revelation, it gives you a clear picture why. In chapters 2 and 3, there are the messages to the church, and then there is no mention of the church again after that. If you look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, the rapture of the church is described. Then in sequential order right after that, the Apostle Paul again teaches that the day of the Lord comes after that. The day of the Lord is described in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 11, after he has already described 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, the rapture of the church. He was very purposeful in doing that. He was a Pharisee, and this is how his mind operated in the explaining of the things of God, God's Word in sequential order. Now, there is no mention of the church <clears throat> after chapter 3 of Revelation, so we must understand literally then that the church is no longer here. Then why are we here? We are the church. If you're a Bible-believing, born-again Christian, you are the church. I'm going to say to you again that the thing that you need to be making yourself concerned about is not looking for conspiracy theories or any kind of other thing related to that under any given rock, or if this individual or that individual is behind all of this. If you want to look at those things, do go ahead and look at it. But know this, your number one responsibility <coughs> excuse me, is to understand those things so that you can go out and make disciples of all the nations. This is the number one thing we are here to be and to be about. Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20, which was the first message in this series. This is the 13th message of this series. Message number one was, this is God's way of getting our attention. What should we be doing? Preaching the gospel. This is what you should be doing. Chapter 6 of Revelation opens up the seal judgments. None of those things have happened yet. Chapter 7 and uh, 8, um, going into chapter 9, opens up the trumpet judgments. None of those things have happened. In chapter 7, 144,000, 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes of the house of Israel go out, are sent, sealed by God, sent by God, to go and preach the gospel to all the nations. That hasn't happened yet either. And then in chapter 11, the two witnesses are sent to speak in Israel. And they go in front of the temple that will be standing. Remember, they are now, if you're at this point in, in biblical history, which is still ahead of us, by the way, we are at the midpoint of the 70th week of Daniel. And the two witnesses come when the Antichrist finally reveals himself for what he is. In the, chapter, in the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel, he makes a, a peace treaty for Israel and convinces all the Jewish people to return to the land. And they are all going to be there because God is going to allow them to be brought through fire. Revelation, uh, Zechariah chapter 13. And he will take a remnant of his people out by fire and purify them. In chapter 13 of Zechariah, they finally are going to be brought through fire. In chapter 12, verse 10 of Zechariah, they look on him whom they have pierced and they run to him. In chapter 14 of Zechariah, there is all the armies of the world, all the nations of the world come up against Jerusalem. 
That hasn't happened yet. And chapters 12, 13, and 14 of Zechariah run parallel to these events from chapter 6 through 16 here of the book of Revelation and onwards until the Messiah does come back. So you see, we can be looking for speculation. We can be looking for all kinds of things about who is behind this virus. But the two witnesses, as I've just mentioned, they have to preach the gospel to Israel so that that one-third of Israel will be saved. And that hasn't happened yet either. Now we're at this place in chapter 16. And there is going to be the last seven judgments that will be poured out upon the world. And they are very similar in a way to the judgments that were poured out on Egypt during the time of the writing of the book of Exodus, which led to the Passover. The first uh, judgment is going to be sores, which are going to be on uh, all the people, verses 2 and 3. And they are going to um, have all kinds of physical sores all over their body. In verse 4, the river, uh, in verse 3, the seas are going to, the, all the oceans are going to turn to blood. The rivers are going to turn to blood in verse 4 very similar to the Nile, which was turned to blood. In verses 8 and 9, scorching fire and heat, there were great uh, lightning storms that came upon Egypt as well. In verse 10 of Revelation 16, darkness comes upon the land. And in that verse 10, what happens is that the people gnaw their tongues for pain, as it says there. And they, in verse 11, they blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pains, their sources, sores. And look what it says here and repented not of their deeds. Dr. Welver, in his commentary in Revelation, says that this is the last time any kind of mention or root of the word repent appears in any part of the book of Revelation. And there is no more opportunity because the final judgments will come out after this. They blaspheme God, and they blaspheme his name. And then verse 12, which is where these comments from our, my contact of the other day are, is brought to, is the Euphrates River dries up, and the armies of the east come. And then in verses 17 to 21, the angel says, It is done. The worst earthquake that ever has ever happened will take place. In verse 20, every single island on planet Earth will disappear. And in verse 21, great hailstones between 60 to 100 pounds will fall from heaven. These are horrid judgments. Nothing like that has happened yet. Even the judgments leading up to verse 11 have not happened yet. The judgments of the bowls and the trumpets and everything else, they have not happened yet. So we cannot be at this point in history. So none of these events have taken place. Therefore, verse 12 has not taken place. Now, Dr. Welford makes, maintains in his commentary on Revelation that the Euphrates River in the 20th century, many of the nations around there built dams. Dams are used to dam up water, and they let a trickle of water through. The water is used in a very difficult place of the world still to live in for irrigation, for water, etc. The, the nation Syria built a huge dam and was going to uh, almost bottle up all, all of the Euphrates a number of years ago, and it almost led to a huge war in the Middle East between all those nations that shared that water. It didn't happen then, because it wasn't time for any of this to happen. Dr. Walbert and Dr. Uh, Wearsby say in their commentaries that God is going to dry up the river. Now, there are times of the dry season in the Middle East, because the water flow from those dams is so reduced, that the Euphrates dries up on its own. Well, if it does dry up on its own or not, it is still God who has caused all these nations to build those dams. And maybe it'll happen at the rainy season, and God will stop the flow of the water, period, at that time, so that those great armies could come through. Now, a couple of other important points to make are this. In 1964, in a Time magazine interview, Mao Zedong, who was then the chairman of the Communist Party and the de facto leader of Communist China at that time, declared that he could raise up an army of 200 million men in no time at all. So that just allows for us to preclude that there is going to be a great 
army coming out from the Orient, from the Far East. I do not think it's just going to be China. I think they may lead the way. Nobody could understand in 1964 why would China do that at this point. Uh, they're not even a part of the United Nations. They're not even considered in world trade. Well, much has changed since then. Richard Nixon went to China in 1972 and opened up, uh, opened up discussions. Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau went to China also about the same time. Pierre Trudeau was a globalist. His son is the same, and he's the Prime Minister of Canada now. The claim that Mao Zedong made in 1964 is ominous for today, because we do know that something is going on in this world, and whether or not, as some of the conspiracy theories say, that China allowed this virus to go out. And here's some of the reasons why. Since President Trump took office in 2016, he ran on the premise of make America great again and to bring manufacturing of common goods back to the United States, to employ people again, to make America great by virtue of her greatness of the past, the manufacturing and the selling of goods to the world. And some are contending that this has gotten China very angry. And one way to deal with the United States is to destroy en masse the economies of the West. Now, whether that's true or not, I do not know. But there is room to think about the origin of this virus and what it could possibly be. Our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, yesterday in his daily address to the nation during this COVID-19 crisis, has made it quite clear that there is no place for the denigration of Oriental people, Chinese peoples in this country, to blame them for this virus. And I agree with him. He also went on to say that there's no place for anti-Semitism in this whole situation. A ministry a friend of ours who has been in Israel working in the gospel ministry there for many years has, puts out a, a letter, uh, usually once, sometimes twice a month, and his letter at the beginning of April dealt with all the conspiracy theories. And he made this very compelling point. He says, conspiracy theories always end up back vilifying the Jewish people and promulgating anti-Semitism. Now, I want you to think about this. Satan is the archenemy of God. He hates Israel. And conspiracy theories continuously bring us back to that. Satan hates Israel. Satan hates you and me, whether you're Jewish or Gentile. Why? Because he hates God, and you have been created in the image of God. He hates God so much that he'd want to see destroyed every single human being on this planet. He doesn't care. He just wants to be God. Whether the elite left likes hearing this or not is not my concern. There possibly is room to think about the origin of this virus, but not because we're looking for conspiracies, because we're looking for God to give us the answers. One commentator, as I said, thinks this may be one way to try and destroy the United States, to not make America great again. Think about America under President Trump the last four years. It was President Trump that moved the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. It is President Trump who instructed the recently newly appointed uh, ambassador to the United Nations from the United States. In her first uh, address to the U.N., she stood up and recently lambasted the United Nations for their horrible vilification and treatment of Israel over the last number of years. Satan hates God's people, Israel. Satan hates those people who stand with Israel. And he'll use anything and anybody to accomplish his means, which is to destroy the Jewish people. Now, is there truth to all of this? Well, we'll see in time. Is the U.S. behind all of this as well? Are they involved in this? We'll see as well in time. That's not the point. 
The point, though, is this. If you can understand who Satan is and what he desires to do, he desires to destroy, not to build up. Jesus called him a liar and said from the beginning there was no truth found in him. Stop chasing conspiracy theories. Start looking in God's word. Be a literalist with the word of God. Understand literally in, in literal and understandable English as we have our, our English Bible, which, which is proven to be uh, absolutely accurate by virtue of the Dead Sea Scrolls and other um, other uh, 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 proofs that have been done in biblical archaeology over the last number of years. Study God's word and understand it literally. And also know this, that God is sovereign and in control. And all he wants of you is to be a good servant of his. During this time, use every opportunity that God may give you to share the gospel with someone. I'm going to give you an example. I had to get some servicing done in one of my cars, or both of my cars, the other day. And they called on Friday to just adjust one of the appointments. And the lady was talking to me over the phone and just gave me some instructions about social distancing when we're in there. And one of the points she made was, I hope you're not fearful about coming in. I said, no, I'm not fearful about any of these things. Are you fearful about anything? And she said she was. And she basically told me she's a lapsed Catholic who owns a Bible, hasn't read it in years. Her name is Nancy, and I would ask you to pray for her. This is an example of the opportunities that God can give us at this time to share the gospel with people who are searching for answers to what is going on around us. Pray that Nancy will indeed look at those first three chapters of the Gospel of John that I mentioned to her and say, said to her, You've got to look at where it says you must be born again in John chapter 3, verses 3 and 16. Pray that some fruit may come from that. These are the times that God gives us an opportunity to serve him, to go out and make disciples of all the nations. I believe that this whole COVID-19 is one way that God is using to draw us to him. God is the one to take refuge in at this time not in conspiracy theories, and not in your own way of trying to figure out how to fix things. Israel's Hope Ministries exists as a faith ministry to share the gospel in this kind of opportunity here, or even over the telephone when someone calls to change an appointment time with you. We exist to tell people literally about God's word, to instruct and to encourage people to grow. We, live, we believe by faith that God provides for us and moves God's people to be the ones who will provide for what our needs are. And there are needs. We're finishing the month of April. Tomorrow is April 30th. The Lord has given us enough, enough to finish this month. And as we look into the month of May, we're looking at needs that are very apparent on the horizon for us. We would ask that you would pray with us that God would send what needs to be sent. And perhaps he may allow for you to send uh, through your own giving. Go to our website, www.ihopecanada.org, where you can find ways that you can uh, give to the work of Israel's Hope, either by PayPal or by e-transfer, if you're in Canada, or if you are um, wishing to just send a check the old-fashioned way, you can do that by uh, mailing it to our P.O. Box, which is noted there on our website, Box 47031, Blackburn Post Office, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K1B 5P9. If you're in the United States and wish to give to the work of Israel's Hope Ministries, you can do that by sending it to I Hope USA 2330 Norton Lane, North Bloomfield, Ohio, 444 Five zero. Just make sure you put on the memo line of the check that you're giving that for the work of Israel's Hope in Canada. Thanks for looking in today. We hope in some way would we have been an encouragement to you. And we ask that now as we close in prayer that the Lord will bless you through this. Thank you, Lord God, for all the time you've given us here now. We ask your blessing and pray that your word not come back empty or void. Praying this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Until next time. Shalom.